Hello everyone, welcome to my Stackelberg Part 2 video. We're going to pick up where we left off in Stackelberg 1. Uh, so hopefully you've watched that, or at least you know what a Stackelberg market is. There's an incumbent firm and an entrant firm. Uh, I had all of this information in that market. There was our demand curve, there's our cost functions. Pretty standard stuff. And then, spoiler alert for if you haven't seen that video, there's how it ends. Very exciting stuff. Q1's 180, Q2 70, profits are 8100 and 2450. Uh, for the sake of comparing what happens in this video to what could be happening later, I've also solved for the monopoly output for if firm one were to operate on its own without firm two. Uh, I did not do a video about that, so you can solve it on your own. If you need to consult my video on Monopoly, go for it. So what are we doing in this video? We're going to now introduce an idea for Firm 2, the question of, do we want to enter the market? Uh, in this case, yes, because our profit is greater than zero. I'm going to introduce now, though, something new that hasn't been there before. I'm going to introduce an entry cost. This is some kind of fixed cost that the second firm has to pay to enter the market that the incumbent firm does not. This could be a new advertising campaign to get your new brand out there in front of the world. It could be a large fixed cost to build a new plant. It could be licensing fees, whatever. There's some sort of cost to entering the market. And that cost will come out of your profit. In a nutshell, what's gonna happen is firm two will enter the market if its profit can compensate for that cost and still leave you with greater than zero dollars in hand. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to look at the decision of firm two uh, as a function of whatever firm one does. The reason we're gonna do this, we're gonna spend more time on this in part three but one thing you're going to see is that firm one can make a lot more money as a monopolist than as a Stackelbergist. That's not a word. Stackelbergist is not a word. Don't ever say that in front of someone who's going to judge you for sounding stupid. Uh, firm one will make more money under Stackelberg, or sorry, will make more money under Monopoly than it will under Stackelberg. Enough so that there may be reason for firm one to deviate from the monopoly quantity of 160. Uh, we might have a situation where it would be better for firm one to abandon its marginal revenue equals marginal cost approach uh, if it allows them to drive firm two out of the market and operate as a monopolist instead of as a Stackelbergist. Fake word again, please don't say it. I'm just having fun with it. Uh, quick intuition as to what I mean. Q1, profit for firm one. Uh, we could have something like this. Here's Stackelberg profits. And here, yeah, let me do my peak a little bit better. And here's firm one's monopoly profit. Now, depending on Firm 2's entry costs, Firm 2 will have some level of profit in the market as a function of Firm 1's quantity. The more Firm 1 floods the market with its product, the lower the price, the less the profit Firm 2 will have. So we're going to see something like this. Now, whether that line belongs here or here or here just depends on entry costs. Uh, for now, I'm just going to draw the one. So right now, I'm just giving you intuition into why we're going to be doing all this stuff. Firm 2's profit goes negative at that point. Meaning, after this point, Firm 1 can... If Firm 1 produces a higher quantity than that, it can push Firm 2 out of the market. And enjoy the monopoly curve. So let's see, if we draw it this way, 
Ooh, did I actually get it right on the first try? Look at that, close enough. Firm one's profit, if it works to deter entry, by the way, I should actually have written that. Uh, this quantity is what I'm gonna call Q1 deter. It's the quantity that pushes firm two out of the market. Firm one's profit under deterrence is greater than firm one's deterrence under Stackelberg. Or sorry, greater than firm one's profit under Stackelberg. And so there's an incentive here for firm one to push firm two out of the market. Now, depending on firm two's entry cost, this green line, as I mentioned earlier, could be in a different place. It could be harder to push them out of the market. It could be easier to push them out of the market. Uh, let's save that for the next video. What I want to do now is I want to build firm two's decision based on the idea that firm one may not choose a quantity that comes from this idea. You see, this marginal revenue equals marginal cost gig is the one that's associated with the peaks of these curves, the profit maximizing points. But that red profit is not at the peak. And so the red point does not need to have this happen. So let's solve for firm two's profit as a function of firm one's Q, whatever that Q may be. Uh, I'm going to just recall the best response function for firm two. This comes from part one, oops, part one for firm two. Uh, the best response function for firm two was 160 minus one half Q1 equals Q2. And this gave me firm two's decision of quantity for whatever firm one actually chooses. Now in Stackelberg, we would then plug this into the demand function and firm one would optimize. We're not going to do that step. We're just going to solve for firm for profits and pri for prices and profits as a function of Q1, whatever it is. So our market Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2, which is equal to Q1 plus 160 minus a half. Q1, see that's Q2, which means it's 160 plus a half Q1. There's our market Q. Uh, let's see, let me get rid of that stuff. Cool. Now, from there we can solve for prices. Price is equal to 200 minus a half of Q equals 200 minus one half times 60. Which means prices are going to be 120 minus a fourth Q1. So we, we've done nothing to talk about what firm one will actually do. We're just have the quantity of price based on whatever it does. With that in mind, we can solve for firm two's profit as a function of Q1. So firm two's profit is equal to Q2 times P minus the marginal, the constant marginal cost minus E. Now, normally, I always write this as Q2 equals, or sorry, as pi 2 equals Q2 times P minus ATC2. Uh, with a constant marginal cost and a fixed cost, this is the same thing, and it makes it easier for me to think about the entry cost. So you don't have to do it that way if you don't want to, but it's how I'm going to do it for this video, and you don't really get a choice. Uh, so what's this going to look like? 
pi 2 is equal to, uh, let's see, q2 was 160 minus 1 half q1, and then times price, well, let's see, price was 120 minus a fourth q1 minus the marginal cost, which was 40 minus e, whatever that thing is. So pi 2 comes out to be uh, 12800 zero, zero, minus e minus 80q1 plus 1 eighth q1 squared. So here I've got firm 2's optimal profit based on whatever the heck firm 1 chooses. And you'll see that for most Q's in our range, it's going to be downward sloping like this green line. And if firm 1 wants to deter entry, all it has to do, let's see, let me write this down, for entry deterrence, and by entry deterrence, I mean pushing firm 2 out of the market, all firm 1 has to do is increase Q1 until pi 2 goes negative. And that's entry deterrence in a nutshell. In part 3, I'm going to continue with this example and add some specific entry costs and talk about what it would mean. For now, that's good enough. I've introduced the concept of entry deterrence, that firm 1 can force firm 2 out of the market and it may be beneficial because they'd rather be a monopolist at the not profit maximizing quantity than to just be a stackleberg leader. So I hope this video is helpful. If not, too bad. Good luck.